Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's get started. <clears throat> if, I could, if I could have all your, uh, your attention, uh, I'd like to get started. Uh, I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming. And especially welcome our two speakers, uh, Governor uh, Sarah Bloom Raskin to my left um, and uh, Chairman Barney Frank uh, over on the far side of the uh, uh, podium. Um, we're very privileged to have them here and especially to have them here at the same time at a time when financial regulation and its reform is still extraordinarily controversial uh, and almost nightly event on the news. In fact, on MSNBC at 6.30, uh, Chairman Frank will be on the news uh, 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 on yet another uh, financial uh, regulatory controversy, and I'll mention a word or two about that um, in inviting them to speak. Um, neither really need introduction to any of you. I know that you all know uh, them well as public figures. Uh, but let me just say very briefly, first of all, with uh, Governor Raskin, uh, who is currently a Rubenstein Fellow at Duke University. Um, she was, has held uh, some of the highest offices in financial regulation in the country and has had uh, various perspectives, all of which were useful. Um, an Amherst and Harvard Law School graduate, uh, Governor Raskin went on to become the um, State of Maryland's uh, Banking Commissioner. And for those of you who are not very familiar with how this works, that meant that all the state chartered banks in Maryland uh, were subject to her jurisdiction. Uh, she, after that, uh, was nominated and confirmed as a governor of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, which is often described as, outside of the military, the most powerful institution on earth um, because of its enormous influence over um, uh, monetary policy, both in the United States and globally. Uh, and she served as governor in that role uh, from uh, 2010 uh, to uh, 2014, uh, whereafter she became deputy treasury secretary under President Obama's administration from 2014 until January 2017. We've been extraordinarily lucky to be able to entice her down here for um, this academic year as a frequent visitor and a very frequent speaker in <coughs> my classes and others. Um, so uh, thank you for coming, Governor. Um, <clears throat> Chairman Frank uh, is perhaps, for those of you who are not very familiar with financial regulation, still best known as one of the two names on the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, that was legislation passed in 2010 uh, to address uh, the aftermath of the financial crisis of 20, uh, 2007 and 2008. Uh, it was a major piece of legislation and it's hard to exaggerate its scale and its importance and it's the biggest uh, piece of regulatory reform and finance since the um, uh, New Deal legislation in the 1930s. Uh, it has to this day remained a flashpoint in political elections around the country because like the Affordable Care Act, it's one of those uh, statements about legislation that just has to be made to lead either to cheering or to angry denun denouncement. Uh, Chairman Frank navigated his way through that uh, very complex piece of uh, legislation, actually with the um, a partnership of, of Congressman Brad Miller at the time, who was uh, a, a local congressman to us. Um, uh, he is no longer in Congress either. And Mel Watt. So, and Mel Watt, there were two names. And Mel Watt, who uh, also local because of the way his district works. So quite a North Carolina partnership there. Uh, and uh, Congress, uh, Chairman Frank was a double Harvard grad, uh, Harvard College and Harvard Law School, originated from New Jersey, but also has had a long uh, and distinguished uh, role in public life, uh, first in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts State Legislature, uh, and then uh, for many years, from 1982 until 2012, when he chose not to run for re-election, re uh, in the House of Representatives, rising to uh, the chairmanship of the Financial Services Committee, which uh, for financial regulation is one of the two uh, primary committees uh, in Congress, the other being the Senate Banking Committee. Uh, and thank you for coming, uh, Chairman. I know you've been spending a day or two here at Duke. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope that may lead to you spending more time down here in good weather. Um, <clears throat> I thought uh, we'd run this very informally, uh, and what I discovered in the last class is it doesn't even need to be run, because once uh, both speakers get going, uh, it's actually quite interesting. 
Um, the, the, but I thought I would set it up by just mentioning some of the, the topics that are likely to be covered. Um, I talked about financial regulation generally, but there's always the question about are banks too big to fail? Are we better off because of Dodd-Frank? If you were to believe some politicians, you would think that we're worse off than ever before, even as banks make more profits than they ever have in history. Uh, have we more work to do uh, on that front? And the work that is going on right now is actually generally in opposition to Dodd-Frank at the, uh, the level of the uh, White House and administration. Uh, but there are many very serious legislators, especially in, in the Senate, that, uh, who are trying to refine and improve the situation. Uh, we have two perspectives, a legislative perspective and an executive perspective with our speakers. Uh, and not always uh, do they uh, agree or do other parts of the executive branch of government and the agencies and so on. So uh, that question is a complicated one to answer. Are, bigs too big to fail? Uh, are banks too big to fail? Uh, I, what more can we do to alleviate complaints that we often hear from the banking industry uh, about uh, the complexity of regulation? Other factors, you've probably heard of the Volcker Rule, which uh, restricts heavily proprietary trading by big banks. Uh, interestingly enough, small banks tend to do a lot of the complaining about it, um, but it's really the big banks that are impacted by that. Should that be changed? Uh, the um, uh, administration currently uh, has talked about refining it, not changing it. Um, we have uh, a decision by the Senate just last evening on mandatory ar arbitration, the Co Co Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which itself is a huge focus for controversy, uh, cre uh, it created a mandatory uh, a rule against mandatory arbitration. Let me make that real for you. If you were a Wells Fargo customer and you discovered that you had had an account opened without your knowledge, part of the recent scandal, uh, your remedy under the arbitration clause of your customer agreement with Wells Fargo would be to go to arbitration, not to go to uh, a, uh, join a class action lawsuit or fi file a private law, uh, lawsuit. Now, that means you go to arbitration before the very institution that just defrauded you. Uh, there's a considerable amount of discomfort with that situation. Large financial organizations and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce all oppose the choice uh, to go to, uh, into the judicial system. And just last night, uh, the Senate voted um, with the casting vote of the Vice President to overrule that rule. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll hear about that. There are whistleblowing elements um, the, uh, uh, that are currently in the news, uh, and I'm sure that will come up. Uh, too big to jail. Uh, are financial institutions not being severely punished enough, uh, given the enormous damage that was caused? Uh, or are we bluffing ourselves that this is just uh, the criminal process is not the, the right way to go? And then finally, there's a lot of uh, momentum uh, in politics to change everything. Uh, and so the Treasury Department under uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, has proposals to make some changes. Uh, there, uh, I, I would be very interested to hear again, we did address this in the previous class, what the political prospects are in Congress of changes. Um, there's certainly been a bill in the House that was passed that would make radical changes to the Dodd-Frank Act. Uh, and so uh, that also leads us into international cooperation. Uh, we're making lots of noises about uh, not participating in what's called the Basel process, uh, much to the consternation of other governments and, ironically, of the big banks that do better under a Basel process than they would do under a domestic process. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to each of you and ask if you would say a few remarks at first. Uh, I hope you'll be glad, uh, willing to take questions from anybody in the audience as well. And I'll prompt if, uh, if, if, if I sense that there's some interest in something that you haven't addressed yet. So thank you. Governor, would you like to go first? Sure. So um, thank you. Very, um, very exciting to be here. not working. Is that correct? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Here you is it? Oh, OK. Yeah. Now it is. <laughs> OK. So um, <clears throat> let me. Um, sort of to start with the really the issue du jour, which is this mandatory um, arbitration move. And I will tie it in really to broader um, developments and reactions and um, uh, uh, issues related to, to the financial crisis. Um, and 
I want to just start by saying this is a this is a very significant event. Okay, uh, what what the Senate did last night in um, overturning the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's um, banning proposed ban of forced arbitration, and it does it does matter for the reasons that that uh, Professor Baxter has pointed out. But I just also want to indicate that in arbitration um, settings. Um, consumers win 9% of the time, 9, okay? It costs, by the way, to bring these cases under arbitration, it costs an average of $7,725, okay? So the incentive to actually do something in arbitration is very much tilted in favor of the corporations and the firms. So they are the ones, essentially, that we're pushing for uh, the Senate to use its power under the Congressional Re Review Act to um, overturn the agency decision, this, at this point the agency being the, the CFPB. And um, what strikes me is kind of a, uh, remarkable about, about this is that um, we are seeing in our country a gradual um, shift of economic risk moving from firms, which historically had done quite a bit of protection of consumers at a certain point, into the realm of the consumer. So the consumers are now bearing much more risk, and they're bearing risk on items that they have no choice in. So you heard the example, the Wells Fargo example. I mean, the people who were hurt by Wells Fargo, they didn't choose to open accounts. Okay, this, the, the whole event was an event in which unauthorized accounts were open. So the consumer had no voice in that. And the consumer was, is, is now forced to actually continue to be forced to use arbitration to resolve that claim. What about Equifax? Okay, the Equifax breach, if you've thought much about that. How many consumers choose to have their information kept at a credit bureau that they've never heard of? Um, with protections around their data that they have no visibility towards. And now we're in a situation where one out of every two Americans find themselves at risk of having personal, confidential, financial data now put in the hands of hackers. Okay. Now, in both, of the, in both the Wells Fargo case and the Equifax case, there's this notion that the harm is, is a little bit out of reach. We don't quite know what, what, what the consumer certainly doesn't, doesn't know essentially what the harm is at the time it happens. There's been no personal agency. And what we see here in this decision of last night um, is I think an explicit step towards a continued, what I would say is a continued shift of economic risk onto consumers even when consumers have no um, choice in the matter. It was not as if anybody chose for these things to happen. Okay. Now, pivot to the, the crisis. And, we'll, and, and, and just to fit this into to what I think is, is relevant from, from the crisis. So the crisis occurred. It was the largest, deepest financial crisis that we had since the Great Depression. One of the focuses I have had in my career, uh, given its timing, its my, my time as a public official and how it coincided with the recession um, and the financial crisis, is really why it was so hard to recover. Why this particular financial crisis, we were not resilient. Why did we, you know, why did we not, I, I understand, you know, kind of we went into it, but when we went into it, how come we stayed down so long? It was longer than anybody anticipated. Some people would argue that we are still to this day dealing with the aftermath of the financial crisis. But from my perspective, I was at the Fed at the time when extraordinary, um, extraordinary uh, accommodation, monetary policy accommodation was happening, things that had not been attempted before. You'll remember QE1, quantitative easing one, followed by a round of quantitative easing two. These were extraordinary monetary policy stimuli that had not been used before. And 
you know, we, we, I, have, I have distinct memories of sitting around the FOMC table and thinking like, how come it hasn't picked up yet? I mean, we have done quite a bit and why are we not better along in the recovery? So this, is fo this has focused my attention quite a bit. Um, I think it comes down to three particular, um, sort of three particular factors that I've isolated. And, um, you know, one has to do really with structural changes in the economy. I think our economy has moved into greater dispersions of income and wealth to such an extent that we don't have the same, um, for lack of a better term, middle class engine that had in prior prior downturns had been a source of resilience, a source of being able to permit the economy to move up faster. Um, we, um, uh, so we, that's one such structural change. The models, by the way, that the Fed uses, something called FERBIS, Federal Reserve Bank US, these models had, you know, propensities to consume in their consumption functions that were kind of based on old, um, senses of dispersions of income and wealth. So I think there is something to the changes in the economy that, that's worth looking at. I think we had disconnected regulation. We had a regulatory system that was not connected to the problems that actually precipitated the crisis and that kept us down for so long. And we have talked about that in other contexts, and we can talk about it more today. And then the third, sort of a third factor is really a lack of understanding as to how the household and consumer gets integrated into our understanding of both the regulatory side, but certainly in terms of the financial side. I think that there was less attention given to that, to those forms of behavior. Than, um, than we had noted, you know, than, than, than people had studied. For example, the foreclosure system turned out to be an extraordinary point that we all had to learn about very quickly uh, during the housing finance uh, downturn. So there, are part, there were parts of our, um, our what, I, what I would call our consumer financial system that had not been sufficiently understood prior to the crisis, and then a lot of fixes had to be made um, on the sort of, you know, sort of fixing the tires of the plane as it's taking off kind of approach um, that, that, that had not been um, appreciated before. So I will, um, I will stop there, but that's kind of an outline of my thinking. Obviously, there's a lot to talk about, and I look forward to hearing from you questions or comments so I can focus on that. I will talk some about the financial problem. Let me just comment on one aspect, because the current political situation is important. Um, we had that vote yesterday, 51 to 50, to kill the regulation. There's a, uh, a procedure that people put through years ago without giving a lot of thought to how it would be used. Ordinarily, as you know, it would take 60 votes to pass a bill in the Senate unless you do it through this process called reconciliation. But there is a special provision that was adopted by statute that says any regulation may be killed by a bill in which only a majority of the Senate has to vote yes, and it's signed by the President within, I think it's 60 days or 90 days of its, uh, of its happening. And uh, it really hadn't been used very much. Uh, the transition from Obama to Trump brought a lot of cases of that because of the very different philosophies. Uh, so what happened was exactly that yesterday, a, a, a serious setback. Uh, for consumers, it essentially means that if you are a consumer and you have been screwed by your bank, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, the ability, is, well, if you are a very wealthy consumer and your bank has somehow hurt you to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars, then you can bring a lawsuit. But if you've lost the relatively small individual sums into the couple of hundreds of dollars that have happened recently, it really does not pay to bring an individual lawsuit. And what the banks are now given the right to do, because it's been restored to them, they can basically say, if you're going to deal with me, you have to give up your right to even join a lawsuit of a whole lot of people, and you have to uh, submit to arbitration. And understand, the banks engage in arbitration all the time. You, the individual, may engage in arbitration once in your life. There are people who make their living as arbitrators.
and they are selected by both parties. Now, if you are an arbitrator by profession, you understand that if the banks get the impression that you are too pro-consumer, you're not going to do a lot of arbitrating. And therefore, when it comes to the profession, you get that 9% figure, which is just so overwhelming. The one point I would make is this, and I would urge people, and I let me be very explicitly political, I am personally sympathetic to Senators Corker and Flake, who appear to be deeply offended by Donald Trump's behavior. And I understand that it is unpleasant to be around it. I wish that instead of being offended by his behavior, they were offended by his public policies, which hurt consumers, because both of those courageous crusaders voted to screw the consumer yesterday. And uh, as I said, I, I would, I'd rather have their vote than their, uh, than their speeches. But uh, we can talk about that some more. Um, the um, other thing I would talk about is the financial reform bill. Um, and let me just give you the general, what we thought we were doing. We'll talk about it some more. Essentially what happened was, well, quick model. We have a private sector that creates wealth in this country. And we have a public sector that, among other things, has to regulate the private sector to make sure that you get the best out of them without the problems. And the private sector always innovates. And inevitably, they're going to outstrip the public sector because at some point the innovation will reach critical mass. The important thing is for the public sector to catch up with that and regulate. A couple quick examples. 1850, there were no large businesses in America. So there's no national regulation, no national legislation. By 1890, there are the railroads and coal and steel and oil. So then the federal response is to pass national legislation. The Antitrust Act, the Federal Trade Commission, the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission. That works for a while, but then because you have all these big national companies, a stock market develops because you've got to now have this kind of finance capitalism. So we have a stock market with no regulation, which contributes to the Great Depression. So the New Deal, in addition to social welfare, does a lot of regulation. By the way, you may have heard people complain that the legislation we passed is too big. Um, I confess, when we were talking about a subject of great importance, to having little concern for people who have short attention spans and are uh, uh, disconcerted because we try to do a lot of things. But one of the reasons we did do a lot of things is that the one bill we did encompassed about 10 different bills that were done in the New Deal. We did them all at once because we were in the middle of a crisis and, 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 and we couldn't wait. Um, but what happened then was in, the New Deal comes up with a very good set of rules. And that works pretty well until the late 70s and the 80s, various regulations. Two things happened uh, beginning in the 70s that undermined our regulation. The first is a lot of money comes into our country from Asian countries with large balances of payments, from oil producing countries, from other people, and then after, the, say, the fall of the Soviet Union, from a lot of uh, people who benefited from, from, from the transitions there. So, in 19, uh, before 1970, if you wanted to make a big loan, you had to go to a bank, and banks were regulated. But by the 70s and 80s, more and more money was available for loans outside the banking system, which came from all these places. The other thing that made the crisis possible was information technology, because what happened in the crisis was a lot of individual financial transactions got bundled together and sold, and that could not have happened if People were doing it by hand. So by the 90s, we had a whole system. Before 1970, if you borrowed money to buy a house, to invest in a business or whatever, you were very likely to have borrowed it from a bank. And the bank that lent it to you was going to frisk you pretty good because they depended on you to pay them back. So banks were incentivized not to lend money to people who couldn't pay them back. And then because a lot of money came in from outside the banks, but also for the banks themselves, you had what was called, you had information technology. We then got into what's called securitization. Securitization means if I'm a bank, I lend half of you money for your mortgage, but instead of waiting for you to pay me back, I take the right to be paid back by all of you, I bundle it into a legal instrument, a security, so the process is called securitization, and they sell it to somebody else. At this point, my concern about whether or not you pay back 
has diminished because I got my money up front. I don't have to worry about whether you're going to pay me back or not. And what happened was people bought those securities. Unfortunately, when the banks didn't have to worry so much about being paid back, they started to make loans to people who couldn't repay them. And that was then, that's really the, the fundamental of the crisis. What happened to those securities? They could bounce around. At any rate, by 2000, a lot of people did believe that we needed a new set of rules, as we had done, say, in the, in the New Deal, to deal with this. But there was political resistance to doing it. The free market was uh, considered to be just the most wonderful thing and didn't need any interference. And it wasn't until the collapse in 2008, and Sarah said, as bad as the Great Depression, in many ways, by the way, it could have been worse than the early 30s, the late 20s and early 30s, because in 1929, you had geographic particularity. Things could be terrible here and okay over there. By 2008, the world was on one grid. And when people started, when, when Lehman Brothers failed and people stopped making payments here, it hit the whole world. But that was the problem. People said, well, we deregulated, and that's what caused the problem. I don't think that's the case. It wasn't deregulation that brought around the crisis. It was a failure to regulate. We didn't catch up. We waited too long. We didn't do what they did when they did the antitrust list. In the, well, the same with the New Deal. Had to have it a crisis, and then they did the regulation. So what we were trying to do in 2009 and 10 was to a great extent deal with the problem that large financial institutions had figured out a way to make money by lending other people money and selling other people things, but dodging the responsibility if they went bad. People thought they had somehow eliminated risk. Well, they had eliminated risk for themselves, it just went elsewhere in the system. And ultimately, that's, that's what, what caused the crisis. So I think we did a pretty good job of restoring market incentives, initiatives, incentives. For example, one of the important things I wish we'd done more of it, we call risk retention. Under the law now, and I wish it covered more things, but in a lot of areas, if you lend people money and then you sell them in a package, the people who sell that package, rather than the people who buy it, are responsible if, if it goes bad. Um, some of you may have seen the movie or read the book, The Big Short. Um, how do you buy a bunch of loans that somebody else made? How do you know whether that's a good buy or not? How do you know if those people are going to pay off the loans? Well, the answer was the rating agencies will tell you. These are the ones who put a rating. They said, oh, you're going to buy that security? We rate it A, or AA minus, or ABC. They had these enormous numbers of things. And here was the basic problem with the rating agencies on which people relied to decide whether these were good things. They made it up. They just plain made it up. They had no idea what they were talking about. And so people bought crap, uh, and then the crap didn't pay off, and that caused problems for everybody else. So that's where we were. I think what we have done has worked out pretty well. There were all kinds of complaints that we were choking off the economy. In fact, the American economy has performed better than most other economies, although with the constraints that Sarah mentioned, but none of them were, the cost, were caused by our, uh, our legislation. We now have uh, President Trump says he doesn't like the bill um, and wants to change it, but here's the deal. In the House, they passed a bill that essentially repeals almost all of what we did, substitutes another way. Um, that bill is called the Choice Act, and people in the House voted for it, the Republicans, securing the knowledge that it would never go anywhere. Uh, they voted for that the way many of the Republicans voted to repeal the President's health care bill back in the days when they knew it was going to be vetoed. Um, in the Senate, they are not paying any attention to that bill, and there is an effort in the Senate now to look at the bill we passed and to make the specific improvements within the general framework that are a uh, that are a good idea. So that's 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 the state of play uh, with that. One last point, and it's the general framework. Uh, we have a major question that we are addressing now in the country increasingly over the past few years, but exacerbated by the financial crisis, a government became very unpopular. When I was growing up, government was very popular. Uh, by the time I left office, I, brief thing, I, um, when I was 13 and thought about, gee, I'd like to get into government someday, I understood that the fact that I'm gay made, meant that was unlikely because 
being gay was to be very unpopular, and to get in the government you had to be popular. As things went on, uh, there was a shift. Uh, being gay became less and less unpopular. Government became more and more unpopular. <laughs> By the time I retired in 2012, and I mean this quite seriously, um, when people talked about what I did, and I'm very proud of the financial reform bill, but when I would be introduced in general, uh, I, there would be more applause when it was mentioned that I am the only member of Congress still who married someone of the same sex while I was still in Congress. Uh, that gets more praise than the financial reform bill. And we are at a point where <laughs> being gay is much more socially acceptable than being a congressman. Um, <laughs> too. That is troubling to me. Obviously, I don't want to change the one, but I do want to change the other. And the, 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 the meta issue that we are dealing with today is what can those of us who believe that we have social problems that we want to alleviate, which cannot be done if the government doesn't work. Remember my model. The, the big problem America, one of the problems America had was we let the private sector outstrip the rules set by the public sector. And there has to be a balance between the private and public sectors. We are now in a period where uh, the public sector is so devalued that our ability to accomplish a lot isn't happening. Key question is whether Donald Trump's approach may be changing that. Uh, for example, and I'll close with this, the health care bill, which was unpopular for the day we were first debating it in 2009, is now popular because people believe that, people deeply believe that government in the healthcare system sucked. But they are now inclined to believe that no government may suck worse than government. And there is this unhappiness now when people see they're gonna lose. So that is, and that, that's also involving our legislation. Um, you saw this today, the 5150 in the Senate. Uh, does the government intervene to protect the average consumer from being mistreated by Wells Fargo or Equifax, uh, or do you just leave it to the private sector? And so that's the context in which these things are being debated. Uh, you mentioned um, the health care. Uh, I'm sure you've been amused by the strongly held dual view that uh, the Affordable Care Act is great and Obamacare is terrible. Oh, no question. You get that with Medicare. I mean, people <laughs> really... And, and, but part of that, by the way, is the fault of those of us on the liberal side. We took the easy way out. Government became more unpopular. Bill Clinton, whom I generally admired, um, gave me... Uh, I was very unhappy when in 1996, giving a State of the Union address, he said, the era of big government is over. I asked some of his people who were there when that era had been. I had apparently slept through it. I didn't <laughs> remember an era. I mean, 1935, maybe, but I wasn't born then. Um, and uh, what, what those of us who do believe that government has a positive role, an essential role in, in, in improving our lives, too often people would treat the one specific thing they wanted as if it was an exception. They would say, well, government's not so good, but this is okay. And that was a great mistake. I mean, it's, yeah, Medicare is very popular. It is very important for us to explain to people that Medicare is an example of government. I, I would today, the example I would give is this. There is a crisis that affects more of the Trump voting demographic than the liberal demographic that's often the beneficiary program. That's the opioid crisis, which is a, a white working class crisis and a, and a more rural crisis, although obviously it affects everybody. I think those of us who believe in government and who want to alleviate the pain that that causes should be coming forward with a big effort to deal with it, stressing that this is government, that the only way you are going to diminish the great pain that people are suffering from opioid is by a significant improvement and it's a increase in the government role in a number of these areas. Um, it's, uh, turning back to the Dodd-Frank Act, is there anything in retrospect, uh, as you look at the uh, huge accomplishments there, that turned out differently from what you expected? In this case, the smaller banks, we did try to protect the smaller banks. They, they are, for example, with regard to the Consumer Bureau, the Consumer Bureau sends out bank examiners. Every bank agency sends out examiners, and every bank hates the bank examiners. They come around and they poke around at what you're doing. We said that the Consumer Bureau would not send examiners to the smaller banks. We did a couple other things for them. The smaller banks are spending more money than we had anticipated, proving that they're in compliance with the bill, including parts of the bill that we didn't think would affect them. But they are kind of more frightened by that. 
So I, I do think in this bill that's going to go through the Senate, and I hope will be passed, there will be a uh, relief from some of the smaller banks from some of these, uh, these rules. We also, the other big mistake I think we made was to set the level at which you get subjected to enhanced supervision at $50 billion. I think that could go to 150 uh, and, and allow the regulators to focus more uh, where there might be a problem and, and, and relieve a burden on people who are not really a problem. Yeah. Uh, Governor Raskin, um, I, I can't re resist asking you, as a cent former central banker, uh, uh, what's your thought about Bitcoin? Mm. Uh, we know what Jamie Dimon thinks, and I sort of share his view, but a lot of my class actually think the opposite. So this is a so it's interesting, and it, it does fit in with this, um, you know, this libertarian anti-government kind of impulse that um, uh, Chairman Frank talks about. So the um, here, you know, here's here's the the thing with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has been used um, primarily uh, to date. Uh, by illicit actors. Okay, so it has it started really as a vehicle by which um, uh, drug dealers and other kind of uh, players who live in the dark web uh, evade detection, evade uh, the ability of um, tracking to occur. So it is a an attempt at anonymity and a vehicle by which the um, the uh, players in this world can avoid detection. So the primary focus that, that certainly Treasury had uh, in the early days of Bitcoin was, you know, that this was this really fell within our financial and, and um, financial intelligence and terrorism section. That was where Bitcoin lived. That is where we saw it played out, and um, and we viewed it really as an enforcement, um, a set of enforcement. Um, uh, responses that were needed to, to look at it. Now, at the same time that this is, uh, this is a product that is, uh, has been historically used in a problematic way, um, it's also the case, if we can sort of hold two ideas in our head at the same time, that the technology that is the backbone of Bitcoin is a potentially promising technology. So the underlying technology for Bitcoin is blockchain blockchain, also known as the distributed ledger. And the, um, the technology, if it were separated, of course, from the bad players, has some very interesting usages. And we see these potential usages in the area of financial inclusion. For example, it's potentially possible that you can imagine the use of blockchain as a device that would bring um, financial um, sort of financial, the benefits of, of finance into areas of the world that have no um, ability to uh, currently to to um, to borrow, to save, to learn about finance. Areas like Somalia, for example. So you can you can imagine the use of this technology as being pretty disruptive and being pretty potentially um, socially powerful. Um, now, my own sense is that the technology, we're, we're, you know, we're starting to see some of its usages. I haven't seen it, I haven't seen anything that's particularly blown me away um, in terms of how it's being used. You have to keep in mind that it does have the capacity to, what we say, um, disintermediate. So you don't need, in financial transactions, you don't need the middleman. You don't need a broker to actually bring transactions together. So a lot of a lot, the large banks are interested in it. They're interested in buying it because they know essentially that their future roles could be limited if in fact their roles as intermediaries uh, become under attack because, because blockchain becomes something permanent. So they're interested in owning a lot of the technology. So you see a, an interesting dynamic where there's a, a lot of startup activity in blockchain, but that startup activity is um, being uh, being um, acquired uh, at a very early stage by by uh, some of the big 
big banks. So um, very interesting dynamics. I think potentially positively disruptive. I personally haven't yet seen um, that um, uh, sort of that potential kind of unleashed. We one of the things that we did at Treasury was try to um, encourage people who were looking at blockchain to do some pilots to, to show its productive uses. Uh, there are plenty of pilots moving around, you know, around the world where these things are, are, are being looked at and potentially it is a, a, a powerful tool. But it's also information technology, which uh, Chairman Frank said right at the beginning was one of the, the engines of the build up to the crisis. Do we know what it's really going to do? given that it is a, such a massively distributed system, governments are, will essentially logically lose control unless they, they, they seize it and control it, which is exactly the opposite of what their proponents want. Mm -hmm. And it's been a tricky, sort of a tricky question as to the extent to which it should be regulated, right? Because at this stage, you know, you could argue it's still, you know, it's very nascent. It's very, it's emerging. And it, if any, if government comes in too early, you can imagine it quashing the kind of innovation. However, you can also imagine it growing to such an extent that it gets too big yeah. to actually then begin to regulate in a meaningful way. So this is a challenge for, for current regulators, what kind of pronouncements they're going to put out regarding um, regarding blockchain, and uh, you see, of course, you know, people who follow this, their efforts to um, think about whether this should be a chartered activity, right? So should you get a kind of license for it? The OCC in particular has talked about putting out a special purpose charter for um, fintech firms. The Office of Comptroller of the Currency, which is the regulator of, traditionally the regulator of national banks. Um, but um, is looking at its authority to actually permit uh, permit non-banks that do something in the realm of what we say fintech, maybe with or without blockchain, to have access to, to the banking system. Now I know from earlier conversations there's a lot of people with questions, so feel free to put your hand up on any issue you'd like addressed. Um, there's, yeah. So um, this is mostly for Congressman uh, Frank, but it seems like for the far left, it's easy to say break up the banks, and then for the right, it's just deregulation. How does someone? How do you craft a message for the center left um, people that kind of just articulates what you said, but down to 140 characters? <laughs> um, I don't tweet uh, because of that. Um, first of all, my I have I think a fairly simple answer to people on the left. Some of the right who talk about break up the banks, and it is to what level? I mean, that it seems to be a fairly simple question. Uh, the, the notion there's one argument that says banks are too big because they have too much political power in this society. I don't think that's true. By the way, when we were f working on the financial reform bill, the lobbyists I had to work uh, worry about were the ones who represent local interests, the community banks, the credit unions, the realtors. The big banks didn't have much, they have influence in the regulatory process, but when it came to passing the bill, the big banks, there were only about eight of them, nobody liked them, and they're geographically concentrated, they only have a few people who represent them. The people who, the, the ones, the group that was most successful, where I lost, on the one, we didn't lose a lot, I lost, I lost to the auto dealers. They got themselves exempted from the Consumer Bureau, because every member of Congress not only has auto dealers in her district, but they are very outgoing. Bankers tend to, you know, people think of the bankers and people sit there and say no to you. The auto dealers, hey, come on down to Crazy Charlie's and all this. <laughs> and that, people like them. And then they sponsor the Little League. Uh, the same with the realtors. That's where much more political power is. Um, so I don't think you want to break them up for that. So then the argument is, well, you got to break them up because you don't want any financial institution to be so big that if it can't pay its debts, it inflicts harm on the whole system. The issue is, is really too much indebtedness in any one institution. Now that is a problem. We did have a problem in 2008 when a couple of big institutions could not pay their debts, Lehman Brothers and AIG, and that inflicted harm on the system. What we did was to say, first of all, we will very much restrain the ways in which they could get into debt and can't pay it off. We made it mostly illegal to make loans to people who can't pay off their loans. 
we have this, the derivatives, which are a very sophisticated, highly leveraged thing. And basically we said, you, essentially we said you can't incur a lot of debt on these transactions unless you put the money up to make sure you can pay for it. So that was our, and, and then we said if you, if, if you can't pay your debts the way AIG couldn't pay its debts, you go out of business, you fail. So you're not too big to fail. You can be too big to be allowed to fail without consequences. But the first thing that happens if a large institution can't pay a step they are, they are put, they're, they're dissolved. It's called, it's an odd semantic thing. When you dissolve a bank, it is called resolving a bank. I don't know why it says that, but that's the rule. So we, we resolve the bank. Um, the alternative is to say that no institution should be so large. Oh, by the way, when we dissolve the bank, the federal government will now pay some of its debts only as much as it is needed to prevent contagion. You know, A can't pay B, and then B can't pay F and X, et cetera, et cetera. But the federal government then is by law required to recover any of the money it paid out from other large financial institutions. No taxpayer money. The alternative is break up the banks. But then there's a very simple question. To what level? How big is too big? I mean, that, nobody's giving me, I've asked everybody who advocates breaking up the banks. The argument is you want no financial institution to be so large that if it can't pay its debts, it, it won't harm the system. That's a pretty small number. And you also have a problem about competitive disadvantage if no bank in America is that big. So I, I literally, and I've asked Bernie Sanders and the president of the Minnesota Federal Reserve, Neil Kashkari, which is a great name for a banker, Kashkari. Although <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled with K's. Um, I asked them, how big is too big? Nobody can tell me, because it's not an answerable question. So that's my, uh, my response on that. As to the right and deregulation, um, the, the uh, answer is, it was the lack of regulation that caused the problem. This is it's just indisputable, that the banks and the financial institutions and the investment houses, they weren't regulated, all these new rules, and they caused this crisis. The regulation we have imposed, I can defend because I think it has done very little damage. Now there's a problem here. Sarah was talking earlier about the large fines that some banks get. Much of the regulation we put in there is to regulate the financial system to try and deal with the innovations that left them able to make loans and not have to stand behind them. I believe today, and I'm talking more about this, for a lot of banks, the bigger problem is not the things that are included in the financial reform bill that I sponsored, but on the money laundering and Bank Secrecy Act, a lot of it is to prevent terrorism uh, financing and drug smuggling. There is much more that goes into that. You, uh, and, and I want to sort that out, but I, I think that you, the, the defense of the regulation we did do of the, of, of the banking industry as opposed to the anti-criminal activity is that it, things have worked pretty well and they can't show me any harm. Is that the tweet you were looking for? <laughs> <laughs> There is time for more questions. Yeah. Uh. Um, this is for Governor Raskin, so or I guess Congressman Frank, too. So y'all are talking about the OCC trying to make a FinTech charter. Um, what, like, what ends is that supposed to serve, and have other countries done that, and have they, what kind of goals have they achieved? So there have been different uh, different approaches that other countries have taken. So um, the, uh, for example, there's something called a regulatory sandbox that uh, the Bank of England is actually using, which um, is a, a completely different kind of approach where firms that are interested in coming into the regulatory space are allowed to sort of play in the sandbox, kind of show their, show their toys. And um, there's been some kind of uh, pressure here in the U.S. To, to adopt such a proposal. Why do they want, I mean, it's interesting that this notion of a charter has been out for a while, and yet nobody has availed themselves of it, right? And that's, I think, uh, pretty significant. I think part of it is the extent to which a fintech firm wants to be under the regulatory umbrella. Um, that's unclear. Right? I think some of them, what they like about it is this ability to preempt 50 state laws. 
Um, so they like the idea that, wow, if we had a national charter, we don't have to worry about, you know, whether the state of Colorado has a, has a law that's different from the state of North Carolina. We can play everywhere with one standard. So they like the preemption, the preemption piece. Interestingly enough, this whole notion of preemption is a Dodd-Frank, you know, Dodd-Frank also addresses preemption in the banking, uh, in the banking uh, space. But um, so the, the motivation has been, uh, I think, largely to, to get the benefit of preemption. I think that they, a lot of firms have held back in actually applying for it because they're not sure what rules are going to come along with that. Um, there have been, um, you know, some kind of early smoke signals from the, uh, from the OCC as to what, you know, what they might be looking for, some kind of financial inclusion plans, something um, regarding how they get regulated. Will there be capital requirements? I mean, so there are, there are, there are real questions as to what that, uh, what that would look like. But my own sense is that the firms want it because they don't want to play by 50 state laws. Do you think, um, from your experience, do you think that the, the tech firms are kind of hardlining on we, don't want, we only want the benefits and not the regulation of the charter? Or has there been, like, good discussion about what regulation would make sense? Well, I'm afraid it's the latter. I think that they would, would probably get very weak regulation. I think my sense is that uh, the OCC, as, as a lot of um, agencies are, you know, are want to do, is they like turf. They like to have more entities in there, you know, under the tent. And so a lot of times they do whatever it, they can do to actually build up their agencies, get in more, get more charters. And I get sometimes concerned that they will do that at the risk of um, safety and soundness, risks to our financial system. They may, especially in the fintech world, I, I don't know, have we, have we done any kind of modeling over what these, um, you know, fintech charters, you know, could, you know, could they present any kind of risk that we haven't yet foreseen? Sam, you had a question? Um, I'm curious, Chair Brett, what you think about the this problem that I, I feel like is sort of a circle that happened after the crisis. It's, it's a little bit like the guy who just committed the bank robbery gets shot by the police and then they take him to the ER and fix him up so they can put him on trial. So, so we, we have this TARP bailout, right, which is, oh no, you're in a crisis because you sold all these mortgage-backed securities and now you know, you're not, uh, you, know, you, you're, you can't get paid. And we bail out the banks and then the DOJ turns around with this FREA statute and it says we're going to sue you all for fraud now if you don't settle with us. And we take these like 10, 12, 13 billion dollar settlements out of the banks. The same banks, for the same conduct that they had been essentially rescued from the consequences of. Once they were healthy enough to pay, we penalized them. Does, does that accomplish anything? Oh, absolutely. And it makes very sense. In the first place, you may not, let me point out, the TARP, which stood for uh, uh, Trouble. Troubled Assets Recovery Program, that when the banking industry and the financial industry seemed to be shutting down, the Bush administration believed, I think correctly, we had to provide, we had to lend money to the banks because the banking system was in the process of shutting down because in a situation in which people were making loans and not getting repaid, nobody wanted to lend anybody any money, and there was a real shutdown. And uh, we didn't keep the banks alive only for the banks. Frankly, if the people stopped being able to get money, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, would have been pretty good. I think Jamie probably had a couple months in the bank that he could have lived on. It was the average person living from paycheck to paycheck that we were worried about. We were keeping that going for them, not for the banks. Beyond that, the $375 billion that was spent out of what was authorized um, of the money that went to banks, the federal government made a profit. They were given a loan so that they did not stop lending so that the economy didn't shut down. So that's what that accomplished. It accomplished, it, it avoided a shutdown of the economy and much more pain for, for the average citizen. No money in your ATM, no ability to cash a check. And the federal government made a profit on that. The only part of the TARP program that was not repaid, I am very proud of, it's the money that kept General Motors and Chrysler from going bankrupt. Uh, it kept them alive. It had not been for the TARP. They would have both gone bankrupt. By the way, Ford, which had enough cash, was equally eager to have General Motors and Chrysler kept alive because if there were no automobile companies, only them, 
there wouldn't have been a supply chain here. So that's what the TARP accomplished. Um, and what did the other thing accomplish? It accomplished uh, two things. First of all, and we didn't do this well enough, some of those settlements on mortgages went to the individuals who had been hurt. It, it, it diminished the pain that individuals felt. Didn't make them whole, but it helped. Secondly, um, it was, uh, we hope, a deterrent for the future, although we did more uh, by making this kind of behavior legal. So I guess I don't, I, I don't get your point. I mean, uh, you say, you're suggesting that it was kind of futile. Um, should we have not kept the banks going and having, no, 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 and because we, the other way around. Well, we well, should well, not have penalized well, them afterwards? Well, you know you're going to be bailed out. What's the deterrence in having to pay the penalty later? Well, uh, you, I, I, no, that's why we put the penalty on. The, 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 again, I, 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 I think you are misstating your own problem. The fact is that we did not, we lent them the money which they had to pay back. And after they paid back more than they had borrowed, because there was interest and there were warrants, so when they returned to profitability, they had to pay something. Over and above that, then they were fined. So where, where's, where's the inconsistency there? I mean, which would you, should we not have lent them the money to keep them in business so we did not have a functioning banking system? Or having done that, should we therefore not have fined them? Which do you think we should not have done? I, I mean, I, I think that, that, that they both made some sense. I, the problem people have said is, well, how come nobody was criminally prosecuted? Frustrating, and I'm not entirely sure why, because we didn't have jurisdiction over that in our committee. Part of it, though, was this. A lot of bad stuff wasn't illegal. It may seem it, but, it, you know, and, and if you're a good liberal, you believe in due process. And an essential element of due process is this. You should not be criminally prosecuted unless you could know fairly clearly that the behavior was illegal. That doesn't mean, that doesn't make ignorance of the law an excuse. If the law is there, you're held accountable for knowing it. But no, it would have been very hard to prove that, now, much of what we did was to make some, to make some of those things illegal. Um, I, I would have preferred that they did some of this, but again, no, I, I think what, what happened there was very sensible. First, you keep the banks in business so you don't have a crash in the economy, and then those people who, who misbehaved, you find them. Uh, I mean, and I, I guess to go back to your analogy, if someone has committed a bank robbery and might be sentenced to 10 years, would you let him die? Is that what you were proposing? I mean, well, it seemed to me that was the premise, that was the premise of your question. Uh, and that is such an important point, the rule of law point, hard as it is for us to except a lot of crimes were not committed even though the popular culture was that bankers were banksters. Uh, and, and I think that helps explain a lot of the fact that uh, many did not go to prison. T totally different in the savings and loan crisis where there were very clear-cut crimes committed by fraud, individuals. Fraud, yeah. yeah. Blatant fraud, right. absolutely. Self-dealing. I wish we never had a hard stop, but sadly we do. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll have to call this to an end and thank the speakers for a great session.